welcome to the third lecture on enzymes and in this particular lecture we are going to focus on enzyme inhibition uh, before i start the lecture i would like to highlight that in order to grasp the concepts delivered in this lecture you will require to know or require to have an idea about enzyme kinetics that means you should focus on the lecture 7 before you listen to this lecture. So in our course, we have two kinds of enzyme inhibition, irreversible inhibition and reversible inhibition. What we are going to do is to follow a roadmap and this is the classification of enzyme inhibition which is done according to the type of inhibitors. So broadly I can classify enzyme inhibitors into reversible inhibitor and irreversible inhibitor. Irreversible inhibitor can be further classified into active site directed irreversible inhibitor and suicide inhibitor. Whereas reversible inhibitor can be classified into competitive inhibitor, non-competitive inhibitor and uncompetitive inhibitor. In our course, we do not have the kinetics of irreversible inhibition. That means we will focus on the mechanism of active site directed and suicide inhibitors but we will not look at the kinetics of such inhibitors. However, for reversible inhibitors, we need to know a bit of kinetics where we will look at the effect of reversible inhibitors on the different kinetic parameters such as Km and Vmax. And by now, I believe you should be conversant with what Km and Vmax are. So let us first start with irreversible inhibitors and in that category we will first focus on active site directed irreversible inhibitor. Now in general if I remove the inhibitor from the medium where the enzyme is present the enzyme will recover its activity and this is the common mechanism that we observe in reversible inhibition. However, in case of irreversible inhibition, these classes of inhibitors inhibit the enzyme irreversibly by chemically modifying the enzyme. So, if the inhibitor is removed, the enzyme does not recover its activity. So, generally, such kind of inhibitors are poisons or they mediate toxicological effect. Let us try to understand this particular type of irreversible inhibition using the example of acetylcholine esterase. Now acetylcholine esterase is an enzyme. What does it do? I believe you have already covered nerve or action potential transmission or nerve impulse transmission in the lectures related to physiology in foundations. However, to recap a bit, in case of neurotransmission, we have two neurons involved. The first one is called the presynaptic neuron. The second one is called the postsynaptic neuron. The junction of the presynaptic neuron, that means this particular part, is referred to as the synapse. Now, when a signal approaches the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron, 
the presynaptic neuron releases a chemical neurotransmitter called acetylcholine which binds to the specific receptor called the acetylcholine receptor popularly known as the cholinergic receptor and by binding to the cholinergic receptor acetylcholine initiates impulses in the postsynaptic neuron once the function of acetylcholine is over it is degraded by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase into acetate and choline so the function of acetylcholine esterase is to degrade acetylcholine into choline and acetate now specific toxins have been developed which bind to acetylcholine esterase and when such toxins bind to acetylcholine esterase acetylcholine cannot be broken down into acetate and choline let us look at such a poison or a toxin which is popularly known as diisopropyl fluorophosphate in some textbooks they call it diisopropyl phosphofluoridate abbreviated as dipf or dfp and dipf was developed as a nerve gas during world war 2 and it is an irreversible active site directed inhibitor of the enzyme acetylcholine esterase so what happens in the presence of dipf so we have the acetylcholine esterase enzyme the active site of acetylcholine esterase has a serine residue dipf that is this particular molecule forms a covalent bond with active site serine of acetylcholine esterase as a result the active site of the enzyme is chemically modified such that its activity is completely impaired in this case if i remove dipf from the medium since it covalently binds to the active site of the enzyme i will not be able to rescue the activity of acetylcholine esterase because the active site serine is permanently and irreversibly modified by dipf sorry for this typographical error just change this particular abbreviation to dipf so since serine is covalently modified the active site of the enzyme will not bind to substrate and since the enzyme cannot bind to substrate and in this case the substrate is acetylcholine it cannot break down acetylcholine into choline and acetate so since the inhibitor irreversibly binds to the active site of the enzyme such an inhibitor can be classified as active site directed irreversible inhibitor and the inhibition mediated by such an inhibitor can be categorized as active site directed irreversible inhibition we take another example and in this case we take the example of a drug called disulfiram popularly known as antabuse and this particular drug is used to treat alcoholism what this drug does it irreversibly binds to the active site of the enzyme aldehyde dehydrogenase and this is the chemical structure of disulfiram let us look into the mechanism of action of this drug 
in a bit more detail. So we have ethanol, which is the key component of any alcohol. Ethanol is converted to acetaldehyde by the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase. Acetaldehyde is then converted to acetic acid by the enzyme aldehyde dehydrogenase. And since these two are dehydrogenase category of enzymes, you can see here in the process the hydrogen is released and the hydrogen or the proton is taken up by NAD which is converted to NADH plus H plus in both these steps. So we have the protons which are released and then in the process ethanol is converted to acetic acid. Disulfiram irreversibly binds to the active site of aldehyde dehydrogenase and therefore acetaldehyde cannot be converted to acetic acid. And since acetaldehyde cannot be converted, it will accumulate and in case of alcohol addicts, when treated with this particular drug, the addicts become sick due to the accumulation of acetaldehyde which leads to alcohol avoidance. So coming back, the drug irreversibly binds to the active site of the enzyme aldehyde dehydrogenase and since it binds to the active site irreversibly, the mechanism of inhibition is active site directed irreversible inhibition. So we have looked at active site directed irreversible inhibition. We move to the second type of irreversible inhibitors classified as suicide inhibitors. In some textbooks, these kind of inhibitors are classified as mechanism based inhibitors or the inhibitory mechanism is sometimes described as mechanism based inactivation. What happens in suicide inhibition is that the original inhibitor is converted to a more effective inhibitor with the help of the same enzyme that ought to be inhibited by the inhibitor. The formed inhibitor binds irreversibly with the enzyme. It will become clear when I talk about two examples. So let us move on to the first example. And in this case, we take the example of the drug allopurinol. And allopurinol is used to treat the condition called gout. But in order to understand the mechanism of inhibition mediated by allopurinol, we need to have an overview of gout. So in our body, the nucleic acids are consistent are made up of purine and pyrimidine bases. These purines from nucleic acids and also from diet are metabolized into hypoxanthine and these conversion of purines to hypoxanthine will be discussed in detail in the course of molecular biology. However, for now, you should know that purines through several steps are converted to hypoxanthine. 
Hypoxanthin in the presence of the enzyme xanthine oxidase is converted to xanthine and xanthine by the catalytic activity of the enzyme xanthine oxidase again is converted to uric acid. Under normal condition, uric acid is excreted through the urine. However, if the plasma uric acid concentration in individuals are elevated, these uric acids lead to the formation of urate crystals and these urate crystals get deposited in the joints which become inflamed and swollen and there is excruciating pain and the condition is known as gout. So this particular drug allopurinol inhibits xanthine oxidase therefore hypoxanthine cannot be converted to uric acid and since the plasma uric acid concentration goes down the person is relieved from gout. So this is how allopurinol is used to treat gout but how does allopurinol mediate its inhibitory effect on xanthine oxidase and this particular part we will have to look at in more detail. So allopurinol and this is the drug allopurinol blocks the action of xanthine oxidase by substrate competition. That means it, meta it mediates competitive inhibition. So this is one particular action mediated by allopurinol. However, the enzyme xanthine oxidase acts on allopurinol and converts it to alloxanthine. Alloxanthine is a non-competitive inhibitor of xanthine oxidase and the potency of inhibition for alloxanthine is much higher compared to the drug allopurinol. I repeat allopurinol competitively inhibits xanthine oxidase but is also but it is also converted by the enzymatic effect of xanthine oxidase to alloxanthine which non-competitively and more potently inhibits the enzyme xanthine oxidase and since xanthine oxidase is inhibited hypoxanthine cannot be converted to uric acid and the plasma levels of uric acid is decreased and the condition and the person is relieved from the condition of gout. So xanthine oxidase itself is responsible for converting allopurinol to alloxanthine. So the drug becomes a more potent inhibitor by the enzyme itself and therefore this kind of inhibition is categorized as suicide inhibition. I hope this is clear. I take another example and this time we talk about aspirin. <clears throat> In order to understand the mechanism of action of aspirin, we need to look at a specific phenomena that occurs under normal physiological conditions. Under normal physiological conditions, arachidonic acid is converted 
to cy uh, converted to prostaglandins by the enzyme cyclooxygenase 1 also abbreviated as cox1 so in many books they don't write cyclooxygenase they just write cox so the term cox stands for cyclooxygenase so the cox1 enzyme catalyzes the conversion of arachidonic acid to prostaglandins prostaglandins mediate plethora of effects inside our body and i am not going to talk about this particular aspect because this should be covered in detail in um, in sections related to immunology and inflammation so arachidonic acid by the catalytic activity of cyclooxygenase is converted to prostaglandins and this these particular chemical molecule are responsible for mediating plethora of physiological effects predominantly inflammation and the step of conversion of arachidonic acid to prostaglandins by cyclooxygenase 1 can be inhibited by the drug aspirin. I believe you already know from your concepts in organic chemistry that aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid and this is the structure of the molecule aspirin. This is a schematic representation of the enzyme COX-1. So this is the enzyme and at the active site of the enzyme we again have a serine residue so such kind of enzymes which have serine at the active site are called serine proteases in our course we have already looked at one serine protease acetylcholine esterase cyclooxygenase 1 or cox1 is a serine protease the drug aspirin or acetyl salicylic acid is converted by this particular enzyme to salicylic acid and you can see here you have a covalent linkage formed between active site serine and the acetate group derived from acetyl salicylic acid salicylic acid that is formed inhibits cyclooxygenase 1 further so this is an example of both active site directed enzyme inhibition as well as suicide inhibition I repeat, aspirin or acetyl salicylic acid is converted by COX-1 to salicylic acid. In the process, the active site of the enzyme is completely impaired as well as the formed salicylic acid also inhibits cyclooxygenase. So, the enzyme is responsible for activating the inhibitor to a more potent form and therefore this inhibition is categorized as suicide inhibition. If I want to recap what I said, a suicide inhibitor is a relatively inert molecule that is transformed by an enzyme at its active site into a reactive compound that irreversibly inactivates the enzyme. The reactive compound forms a covalent bond with a nearby functional group within the active site of the enzyme causing irreversible inhibition. And such inhibitors are categorized or called 
suicide inhibitors because the enzyme appears to commit suicide by activating the inhibitor which later inhibits the enzyme. I hope you have understood the two broad classes of irreversible inhibition. We go back to our flow chart. We have looked at both suicide inhibitors and active site directed inhibitors, both of which are mediating irreversible inhibition. Now we come to the next category of inhibitors which are reversible inhibitors. In this category we have further three classes competitive, uncompetitive and non-competitive and for each of these classes we will have to look at the effect of the inhibitor on the kinetic parameter Km and Vmax. So let us start with the first class of reversible inhibitors, the competitive inhibitors. Now the take home message for this particular type of inhibitors or the mechanism of competitive inhibition is that the inhibitor molecule resembles the real substrate in terms of its structure. So this kind of inhibition is often known as substrate analog inhibition. The inhibitor and the substrate bind to the same site that means they both bind to the active site. If I consider this the active site of the enzyme then both substrate and the inhibitor will bind to the active site. In the presence of the inhibitor we get the enzyme inhibitor complex and the formation of the enzyme inhibitor complex cannot give rise to product formation. As long as the competitive inhibitor holds the active site, that means if this particular site is occupied by the inhibitor, the substrate cannot bind to the enzyme, that is the enzyme is not available for the substrate to bind and the inhibition can be modulated by relative concentrations of the substrate and the inhibitor. If I want to have a schematic overview for this particular inhibition, let us revisit it again. So this is the enzyme, the enzyme has an active site. The substrate binds to the active site in the absence of the inhibitor giving rise to the enzyme substrate complex which then leads to the formation of the product. The enzyme goes back and binds to further substrate molecules and the reaction keeps on happening till all the substrate has been converted to the product. The inhibitor, the inhibitor, the competitive inhibitor, when it is present in the reaction system, binds to the active site of the enzyme. As a result, the substrate cannot bind. The enzyme inhibitor complex does not lead to any product formation. However, if I keep on increasing the concentration of the substrate, I can rescue the activity of the enzyme because there is a competition of binding to the enzyme active site between the substrate and the inhibitor. So a competitive inhibitor diminishes the rate of catalysis by reducing the proportion of enzyme molecules 
bound to a substrate. Competitive inhibition can be relieved by increasing the substrate concentration. I mentioned this in the previous slide. And therefore, if I keep on increasing the substrate concentration, I can really I can regain the maximum velocity or the Vmax. So a higher substrate concentration is therefore needed to achieve a half maximum rate and in line the half maximum rate or the half maximum velocity is the Km. So in presence of the competitive inhibitor, the Km will increase. And as I keep on increasing the substrate concentration, the substrate will be able to displace the inhibitor from the active site. And in doing so, I can again achieve the maximum velocity or maximum rate of the reaction in line the Vmax is not influenced by this type of inhibition. This will become clear when we look at the michaelis menten and the line weaver work plots. First let us take an example we have succinate. Succinate is converted to fumarate and this reaction, I have chosen this reaction because it's there in our course. So succinate is converted to fumarate by the catalytic activity of the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase. If I look at the structure of succinate, this is the structure has two carboxylic groups and in the process because it's a dehydrogenation reaction we lose hydrogen or protons and we get fumarate so if i want to have an inhibitor for succinate dehydrogenase i will take an analog of the substrate that is an analog for succinate and add it to the reaction medium and the analog of succinate that will inhibit the reaction is malonate. If you look at the structure of malonate and compare it with that of succinate, you will see that both of them have similar structures at least the polar residues which are responsible for binding to the active site. So when I add malonate, it binds to succinate dehydrogenase. As a result, succinate cannot bind and fumarate is not formed. As I keep on increasing the concentration of succinate, I can relieve the inhibition. In the process, succinate will start binding to succinate dehydrogenase and fumarate will be formed. Now what happens to the different kinetic parameters in the presence of a competitive inhibitor? You already know that this is the michaelis menten plot. And we plot it in the presence of a fixed concentration of enzyme. So you need to remember this particular concept. In the absence of the inhibitor, we get a hyperbolic plot, which is indicated by the red. When I add the inhibitor, the inhibitor binds to the active site. However, as I keep on increasing the substrate concentration, the inhibition is relieved and I am able to achieve Vmax. 
However, I will require more substrate to reach half the maximum velocity. And since I am requiring more substrate to reach half the maximal velocity, I will have a higher Km value. But with the increase in substrate concentration, I am able to achieve the maximal velocity. Therefore, there will not be any change in Vmax. So the Vmax will remain same. So in the presence of competitive inhibitor, Km increases, Vmax remains unchanged. How how the line weaver Burke plot will look in the presence of a competitive inhibitor. Remember, we looked at the line weaver Burke plot in lecture 7. So it's a double reciprocal plot. You now know that in case of competitive inhibition, there is no change in Vmax. So this particular intercept will not change. But Km increases. So there will be a change in Km and mind it, this is minus 1 by Km. So you need to be careful when interpreting the plot because you are looking at the value of minus 1 by Km. However, the take home message is the Km is changing, the Vmax remains unchanged. The ratio of Km to Vmax, which is the slope, will of course change because Km has changed. In the exam, we can give you a specific condition, give you the plot and ask you to interpret the mechanism of inhibition. So by looking at the plot, you should be able to tell me if it's a competitive inhibitor or if it's a non-competitive inhibitor, or if it's an uncompetitive inhibitor. So coming back, in competitive inhibition, Km increases, Vmax remains unchanged. We take a clinical example of competitive enzyme inhibition. And I want to focus on this because this particular group of drugs that mediate competitive inhibition are very, very important and they are usually prescribed for management of hyperlipidemia or management of blood cholesterol levels. And this group of drugs are popularly known as statins and you may have heard of them as it is commonly prescribed drug for different lifestyle diseases. So what these types of drug do is that they reduce the formation of cholesterol in our body or reduce the synthesis of cholesterol in our body. So the formation of cholesterol is tightly regulated. It starts with acetyl coenzyme A and we will encounter acetyl coenzyme A repeatedly in our course. Acetyl coenzyme A is converted to HMG coenzyme A and HMG coenzyme A is converted to mevalonate. This is a rate limiting process. What is a rate limiting process? We will talk about it when we talk about glycolysis. So I'm just introducing the term here. So HMG coenzyme A is converted to mevalonate. And this particular step is catalyzed by the enzyme HMG coenzyme A reductase. Mevalonate through a series of reactions is converted to cholesterol. And we are not going to discuss these steps at this point of time. However, for your information, mevalonate 
through a series of reactions is converted to cholesterol. So if I stop the conversion of HMG coenzyme A to mevalonate, I will be able to stop the formation of cholesterol. So these drugs are competitive inhibitors of the enzyme HMG coenzyme A reductase. So <clears throat> there are different types of statins and I am not going to talk about the different types. I do not know if they will be talking about it in, in the program but for your knowledge there are two types type 1 and type 2. In type 1 we have simvastatin which is still used. This particular statin has been discontinued and the two other popular statins that are used for the treatment of hyperlipidemia are atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. This particular drug is used in people who do not have renal impairment, sorry, uh, in people who have renal impairment, whereas rosuvastatin is uh, is prescribed for patients with renal impairment. But if you look at this particular part of the drugs for all the statins, you have this particular chemical moiety which is a substrate analog for HMG coenzyme A, the substrate for HMG coenzyme A reductase. So if I look at the HMG coenzyme A reductase active site, in the absence of statins, HMG coenzyme A, that is the substrate which binds to the active site, and HMG coenzyme A through a series of steps is converted to cholesterol. However, in the presence of the drug, this particular, this particular chemical moiety or this particular chemical moiety shown here resembles the substrate and therefore competes with the substrate to bind to the active site. As a result, HMG coenzyme A cannot bind to the active site of the enzyme. In turn, it cannot be converted to mevalonate and since this step is inhibited, cholesterol is also not formed. If I keep on increasing the concentration of HMG, co HMG coenzyme A, I will be able to relieve the inhibition and therefore this kind of inhibition is popularly known as competitive inhibition. So I come back to the Michael S. Menten plot. You have no inhibitor and you get the Vmax. You have the competitive inhibitor and I can achieve the Vmax by increasing substrate concentrations. However, since I am increasing substrate, increasing substrate concentration to achieve the Vmax, I have now changed the Km. So the Km has increased. I can say that in the presence of the inhibitor, the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate has decreased. And if I look at the line weaver work plot, there is no change in Vmax but there is a change in Km and of course the slopes will change because the ratio of Km to Vmax is changing. Here they have talked about LOVA statin but any statin will have this particular chemical group which is a substrate analog for HMG coenzyme A. So we have looked at competitive inhibition, we have looked at the effect of competitive inhibitors 
of the different kinetic parameters. We move on to the next type of inhibition which is non-competitive inhibition. Now in order to appreciate non-competitive inhibition, we have to go back to the first lecture of enzymes where I talked about a term called the allosteric site. So let us take an example of an hypothetical enzyme which has two sites, the active site and the allosteric site. I even mentioned that the allosteric site is the site where regulatory molecules bind and binding of regulatory molecules to the allosteric site causes a conformational change in the active site which may either increase the affinity of a particular enzyme towards its substrate and we call it a positive allosteric regulator or the conformational change may be such that it may decrease the affinity of the enzyme for a specific substrate and in that case we identify the regulator as negative allosteric regulator. So non-competitive inhibition or non-competitive inhibitors can be categorized as negative allosteric regulators of enzymes. So what happens when the inhibitor binds to the allosteric site? There is a conformational change in the active site as a result, the substrate is not able to bind. Remember, here, the inhibitor will not bind to the active site of the enzyme. Here, the inhibition is mediated by the binding of the inhibitor to the allosteric site. So this is the site where the inhibitor binds. There is a conformational change. As a result, the substrate fails to bind to the active site leading to no product formation. So the inhibitor binds at a site other than the active site on the enzyme and causes conformational changes on enzyme at the active site and inactivates the enzyme. In case of non-competitive inhibitors, the inhibitor has no structural resemblance with the substrate. Also, there is no competition between the inhibitor and the substrate for the active site of the molecule because the binding site of the inhibitor is different from the binding site of the substrate. We look at, so we look at the Michaelis Menten plot here. As I increase the concentration of the substrate in the presence of the inhibitor, in the presence of the inhibitor, I will never be able to achieve the V max. The reason is the active site is not the binding site for the inhibitor. Therefore, V max decreases. However, when I look at the plot, I can see here that the Km for the reaction remains unchanged. So in case of non-competitive inhibition, Vmax decreases, but Km remains unchanged. If I plot it using, if, if I want to see the effect on the line weaver work plot, there is no change in Km, so this intercept remains the same, same both in the absence and in the presence of the inhibitor for a specific enzyme. However, since Vmax is decreasing, this particular intercept will change. Again, be careful that you are looking at the inverse of Vmax. So, when interpreting you need to look at the curve carefully or look at the plot carefully. So Km remains unchanged 
V max decreases, of course, Km to V max will also be affected, that is, the slope of the lines will change. It's not very easy to cite an example of non competitive inhibitor in terms of drug activity. But I have taken uh, an example of a platelet, antiplatelet drug popularly known as clopid, clopidogrel and clopidogrel binds to ADP receptor P2Y12. So it binds to an allosteric site of this receptor P2Y12. As a result of this, ADP cannot bind to this particular receptor and this leads to a plethora of effect inside the platelet. Of course, I believe this particular drug will be dealt in detail in hematology, but what I want to focus for the time being now is that this drug mediates its inhibitory effect on the receptor by non-competitive inhibition. So we come to the end of non-competitive inhibition. We have looked at how the inhibition is mediated. For simplicity, just correlate this inhibition with negative allosteric regulation. And what you need to remember is that the Km remains unchanged, but the Vmax decreases. So we come to the third kind of reversible inhibition, which is called uncompetitive inhibition. In uncompetitive inhibition, the inhibitor binds only to the enzyme substrate complex. That means it will not bind to the enzyme alone. It will not bind to the substrate alone. But when the enzyme and substrates have formed the complex, the enzyme substrate complex will then bind the inhibitor. Sometimes they will define uncompetitive inhibition as a type of inhibition where the inhibitor binds to the enzyme substrate complex to form a dead end complex. So this is a classical definition of uncompetitive inhibition. I reiterate here the inhibitor does not have any affinity for the active site of the enzyme or the enzyme alone. Inhibitor only binds only binds to the enzyme substrate complex but never to the free enzyme. And in this case both Vmax and Km are decreased. So if I want to plot the effect of this inhibitor using the michaelis menten plot, in presence of the inhibitor, the Vmax decreases and also if you look at it, the Km also decreases. If I want to have it on the line weaver -Burk plot, the Km is changed the Vmax is changed and therefore this is a very unique kind of enzyme inhibition. We do not have many examples of uncompetitive inhibition in relation to drug action, but there are certain drugs used to treat psychological disorders containing lithium where the drug binds to its target and the mode of action is uncompetitive in nature. What I have done, I have borrowed a slide from a colleague and a friend of mine and this is kind of a summary slide which you should look at before you go for the exam. Uh, 
So we have competitive inhibition. And what you need to do here is to picturize in your mind the Michaelis Menten and the Lime Weaver Burke plot for each kind of inhibition. And remember this in case of competitive Vmax remains unchanged, Km increases. In non competitive Vmax decreases, but Km remains unchanged. And in case of uncompetitive, both Vmax and Km decreases. And this is a reflection of the inhibitor on the line weaver work plot for competitive, non competitive, and uncompetitive mode of inhibition. So, this is kind of a conceptual slide that you should probably print out and keep it with you so that you can look at it before you go for the exam. In many <coughs> assessments, they will ask you to compare competitive and non competitive inhibition. So, I have made a slide on that. So, competitive inhibition, active site is involved in non competitive inhibition allosteric or a site other than the active site is involved. The structure of the inhibitor is a substrate analog. In case of non-competitive, it is an unrelated molecule. If I increase the substrate concentration, I can relieve the inhibition. In this case, we have no such effect. Km is increased, Km does not change. Vmax does not change, Vmax is decreased. This is a type of inhibition where we see most of the drugs are mediating their action through, the, through this mode of inhibition. Non-competitive, of course, I talked about a drug, but actually I talked about a receptor and a drug interaction. I didn't talk about uh, an enzyme, uh, enzyme and uh, drug interaction, but there are few examples, not easily available, but most of the time non-competitive inhibition inhibitors, most of the time, mark my words, they mediate toxicological activity. Now I have a question for you and you need to answer it for me. In uncompetitive inhibition, the Km is decreased, which is unique. That means in the presence of the inhibitor, uh, the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate is increased. So the inhibition is actually, the inhibitor is actually increasing the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate. You need to provide me with an explanation for this effect. Please uh, use the internet for this because I do not think it is mentioned in any textbook why <coughs> the Km is decreased. And for a hint, you can use the principle called the Le Chatelier's principle to elaborate on this answer. But I need you to answer this question because it is important. I believe you know what Le Chatelier's principle is and it should have been covered in your basics of organic chemistry and uh, which was uh, delivered early in the early uh, part of foundations. So please answer this question, why the Km is decreased in the presence of uncompetitive inhibitor. Lastly, I will like you to go back to your textbook this is a fantastic uh, recap of the complete section on enzymes. So it talks about what we have talked in the, in the three different lecture series. So I would like you to probably have a printout or a scanned copy of this particular page with you so that you can look at it before the exam because it completely summarizes it talks about the effect of temperature, cofactors, inhibitors. It doesn't talk about irreversible inhibition, which is missing in this case. That's the reason I covered that part in a bit of detail 
because most of the textbooks in biochemistry they do not cover irreversible inhibition in detail so that's it for today i wish you all the best and next lecture will be on glycolysis which is the first lecture on metabolism thank you for listening and have a nice day